Burn like the fire in our hearts, right? Hey, Amen. I'm going to get out of the dark here in a second. There we go. So I get the joy one more time of introducing my friend, Paul. Now, I was just thinking back. The way that we met, we went to an IMA, which is who I hold my credentials through, and Pastor Mike and Pastor Tanner, and uh, it's International Ministerial Alliance. And the first time that I met him, we actually were, it was the coronavirus, which is what he talked about. We had that, and then we wound up meeting out on Main Street, and there was this little place that we went, and I got to eat with him and another young man named John. And uh, I cannot tell you how much I appreciated my time. They just sat across from the table and encouraged me, and hopefully I got to encourage them. And, uh, you know, he's the real deal. He really is, man. His heart is for Jesus and for Seguin, Texas. Um, you know, he gets to see a lot of cattle and, and farmland and stuff like that, so he's, he's there. But let me tell you, man, he, he took that church, and he's run with it, and God's used him, and he's got a true, true heart. So how many of you guys enjoyed what happened this morning? Amen. It's so good. That will be available online in the next couple of days or so, so uh, share it with your friends. It is really encouraging. But one more time, let's give it up for our friend, Pastor Paul, as he comes up. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Yeah. Well, hey, this is what this is all about, is Jesus, can we give him all the honor and all the praise and all the glory? Let's not patty cake. Let's celebrate Jesus in this place. Man, we're all about Jesus at Ray of Hope Church. Great to see all you guys here today and, and tonight. What a joy. I love this church. Uh, this morning and then coming back uh, to gather and worship uh, tonight and then to hear some of the praise reports and testimonies of just hanging out with Pastor Mike and Pastor Matt uh, over the last couple of days and just hearing even since Easter like the Easter event that you had and the Easter services and uh, the life changes and genuine transformations and people who got saved and then there's baptisms coming up and growing in Christ come on let's give the Lord a hand for all that isn't that great man that's that's praiseworthy wonderful what God's doing around here and that's uh, evidence in uh, the miracle working power of of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do y'all believe that? He's not the God of yesterday and of yesterday and of yesterday. There's a, uh, a man in our church. Uh, he's been a pastor for many years. His name is Bob Jane. He goes and preaches a lot and kind of makes our, our church his home base. And he told us a testimony. We're highlighting more testimonies in our church. And he said, Paul, I was covered with stage four pancreatic, prostate, colon cancer in my bone marrow, stage four uh, cancer, and he says, I was praying about it, and he goes, and then I went in Wednesday, and I prayed for him on Tuesday, and our elders just gathered around, and he says, tomorrow I'm going in for a PET scan, and that next day, he came out of that PET scan, and he says, the doctor was amazed by the testimony of what a witness that I was, in that it was completely clear. There's no cancer in my body. Come on, we can do better than that, church. And then he said, he said, my heart was functioning at 23%. And so on top of that, the cherry on top of the ice cream for that would be, he says, and he said, not only is all the cancer gone, you'll need no radiation, no chemo, you're a completely restored person. He says, your heart is 100% functioning. And so, I mean, God, to be, God be the glory for that. Great things he is doing in our midst. And, and that's what I want to talk about here. That's just one testimony, but there's testimonies coming out of this church and, and our church. And God's moving. He's breathing on people from old to new, from death to life. Romans chapter 8 is kind of a good jumping off point for resurrection life. God who breathes life and brings life into dead things and dead areas and maybe you feel like lately like there's been some things that have been, been kind of deceased or RIP or dead or kind of hanging on by a thread or you're at wit's end and it just kind of looks like it's a hopeless situation but Romans chapter 8 verse 11 Paul tells us he says the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you the spirit means the power of God the power of God or the spirit of God, that same, you think about how much power it would take for God to raise a dead guy out of the grave 2,000 years ago. Well, that same power is available for us. That same power that ripped him up out of the tomb 2,000 years ago was not just a one-off. It wasn't just a one-time event. It's available and accessible to each and every one of us because he goes on to say, he who raised Christ 
from the dead will also give life to you and I. Isn't that good news? To your mortal bodies, Pastor Bob Jane and Paul Mason. This is our story, is that this is the God who still does these things. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you feel like your family or your finances or even your dream or your future, he's a God that brings dead things back to life. I, I love this story. There's probably not a more relevant right now story that speaks to this. It's an accurate story. It's Bob Jane's story. It's, it's my story. It's probably a lot of your story here is probably no better place than Acts chapter 20 where you feel like things are dormant or things may be done. Uh, let's go to that here today, this great story, and take a, a look at the life of Eutychus, the apostle Paul, gathered worship like we are uh, here this evening. And it goes into our right now world, I believe. It, it simply says it this way. On the first day of the week, how many know great things happen when we gather on the first day of the week? On Sunday morning, on Sunday night, great things can happen. And they came together to break bread. Probably the word in Greek right there is probably something like chips and queso or sopapillas. This is South Jerusalem. This is, this is tamales or something like I had for lunch today at that awesome Mexican restaurant. That's what break bread means. And they were doing communion. They were doing meals together. And Paul spoke to the people and uh, Paul liked to speak. He was Mr. Many Words. He just kept on. You ever been like in a meeting before and you thought it was only going to take about 15 minutes and all of a sudden about three hours later you're just trying to scratch your head and try to figure out how you get out of this meeting? You ever had somebody ask you to like move them and I only got a couple of pieces of heavy furniture and it's and they don't tell you that it's on the second or third story of the apartment. They just say, I just need a little help. It might just take a little bit of time. And about two weeks later, you're still boxing up stuff together. Well, this is kind of like it didn't intend to go this way. But Paul just kept on preaching and he just kept on he didn't know how to really land the plane. He just kept on talking. Now, we have to let this guy off the hook a little bit because this is, don't give him too much grief because this is the last time he's speaking to these folks. He really cares and loves them, so he's going to keep on preaching. So Paul spoke uh, to the people, and because he intended to leave, it goes on to say, verse 8, that I got it here. Here we go. It says, there were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting, and seated in a window was a, a young man by the name of Eutychus. Anybody in here named Eutychus at all? Yeah, I didn't think so. If I would have said that this morning, I don't think anybody in the first service would have, or second service would have said Eutychus, Eutychus too, if your mama would have named you Eutychus, or if somebody was preaching that long, all the way up till midnight. And what was he doing? He was sound asleep. He sinks into, interesting words, sinks into a deep sleep as Paul kept on talking on uh, and on. Like he's just, uh, I'm only on point number 37, but I've got 70 points. By the way, I'm not going to do that tonight. And everybody said amen to that. So anyway, Paul can get away with this, the apostle. And he's sound asleep, and it goes on uh, to say that he, of course, falls out of this window, and, and Paul talks on and on, and he falls out in the middle of the sermon. I mean, this third story, he comes crashing down to the concrete, he's picked up dead. And Paul, good pastor here. I mean, he's a good preacher. He goes down just in the middle of the sermon, just a little time out, a little commercial break. Let's just go down the stairs. He throws himself on the young man, put his arms around him, and then he goes back upstairs, and then he says, I got six more hours in me. I mean, I'm going to preach a 13-hour sermon all the way up until daybreak. But I got a sneaky suspicion that I don't think Eutychus sat in the same window when they came back. I can't prove it, but I think that probably now he's not leaning in. I think he's leaning, uh, leaning out. I think he's leaning in. I think this is first row, front row Christianity. He's probably on the front row uh, saying, you know what, I'm going to listen to what this guy said because he just raised me from the dead. What a great story of resurrection life. The moral of the story is have church on the first floor. Nobody dies, right? So... But out of the third, just an amazing story what happens. Out of the third story, he falls out of this window, but Paul does something amazing to raise this young man back to life. You know, I've heard this preached many times in my life. I've heard things like, you know, the dangers of falling asleep in the middle of church, or I've heard some stories about, like, don't, don't catch yourself ever falling asleep in the middle of a, of a sermon, and you may die. And I've heard all these kind of things preach you know it was uh, a couple of years ago that I was here 
and a precious godly saint. I mean, you may be here tonight. She came up to me right before, and I'd never been to this church before, uh, to Ray of Hope, and so I'm checking it out. We're getting ready to start worship, and she, just, she walked up to me, just precious. Oh, it's just such, such a blessing. How many know older people can kind of get away with saying some things, and you just love them anyway? I mean, you just, you just bless them and hug them, and so she comes up, and she goes, I'm just gonna tell you. She says, I don't know who you are, she told me, it was, it was right there, right there in the middle of this aisle. And she goes, uh, we've had a lot of guest ministers before, but I just, just wanna give you a little heads up. And she said it with a big smile. She goes, I just sleep. I sleep in the middle of sermons. I love my pastors to death, but I just sleep on guest ministers that come through. It doesn't matter how great they are, how much of a blessing they are. I'm just gonna tell you, I just... I've snored all over all kind of sermons all through the years. Are you here? You may be here tonight. I don't know. Do you remember a conversation that you had with me a couple years ago, like right there? You may be here tonight. And so, uh, and she goes, so I'm just going to let you know. I just, I don't want you to get upset or whatever. If you see me with my mouth wide open in the middle of my sermon, I'm sure it's good. And I may go listen to it later and kind of in parts or whatever. And so I'll put it all together and I'm sure it's going to be an encouragement, but I'm just gonna sleep in fact I usually sleep about five times in a a sermon and so uh, I hope that you do good and I'm praying for you and then I walked up and then I preached of course right here in this church and I came down and she met me right here and she just she hugged me and she smiled and she goes oh that was so great I was so encouraged she goes normally I go to sleep five times during a sermon but your sermon was so good I only fell asleep once and I'm sitting there going I don't know if that's a compliment or not that's kind of awkward but that's really really awesome and man she just embraced me and so I don't I don't know maybe you're here uh, tonight I mean that's an honest lady I mean to say I, you know, there's probably not a whole lot of people that somebody would say that honestly to somebody that you're up under somebody else's ministry that you haven't heard before and say, I'm just going to tell you, I sleep and I sleep on everybody. So uh, I'm just going to let you know about all that stuff. But, but uh, if you hear like a little drone noise of somebody, that's probably you sleeping right there. And so we give it up for that lady. But that's, it's, a, it's a sweet time. Listen, I'll, I'll sleep anywhere as I'm kind of getting a little bit uh, older, I'll sleep on a, in a car. It's not hard for me to, uh, I went on a boat not too long ago and I slept on the boat. I, I'll sleep at a show. I, it doesn't take me long to, I'll snore on a plane before the plane takes off. I'll just start, I'll snore all over that plane. I got no shame in my game, man. I will snore, I will, on a horse, a golf cart, it doesn't matter. I just don't have any problem falling uh, asleep at all. I, I remember there was a, a story early on in my ministry, I was a youth pastor in Donaldsonville, uh, Louisiana, and there was this couple that wanted to come in and actually uh, have a little marriage counseling session. And it was uh, scheduled for late in the afternoon, a sweet Cajun lady and her husband. And uh, there's just something about, I mean, you know when that sleep comes on you and you kind of like have to slap your face or you're driving down the road and you have to put down the window or t- crank up the radio. I mean, you're just trying, you're going cross-eyed a little bit. That, that's times like that that happens to me. but. Anyway, if I can sit in a comfy chair, especially after eating something. And I, so I remember that this was a marriage counseling session late in the afternoon, and it's Donaldsonville, Louisiana, a Cajun town, and I had just eaten some crawfish etouffee. Come on, Jesus. I mean, how many are getting hungry right now? And so, I mean, we had beignets, some donuts afterwards, and man, I was loaded down. I was just fat and happy and I was just kind of sleepy and I I go into Louisiana's pretty hot like all the time and I go into the office late session in the afternoon and I sat down in that comfy chair and all of a sudden those beignets and everything kind of just starts sinking and I start sinking it's kind of a little bit warm in that office outside that office building and I begin to start just kind of sinking and she had one of those um one of those voices she had just had that voice and it sounds kind of like a sleeping machine 
Y'all ever been around people like that? It was like that, 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 and she's just going like this, and she doesn't stop talking. And the more she talks, I mean, it kind of sounds like a rainforest or something. That, 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 and I'm sinking, and I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm gone. I'm like completely, I'm the pastor of that church and here I am in the middle of a marriage. How awkward is that? In the middle of a, ca- a counseling session and she just keeps on going and I'm dreaming. I'm dream- I'm, all I'm hearing is that, 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 that. I'm hearing a sleep machine. I'm off dreaming about a rainforest somewhere and off in the distance, I'm talking about all of a sudden I hear like somebody, it's in that same sound, that, that woman, I hear her calling, Pastor Paul. Pastor Paul, and what do you do when you're sitting there doing a marriage counseling session and you hear something off in the distance? Pastor Paul, I think you're falling asleep. What do you do when you're counseling somebody in the middle of a marriage counseling session? You just, and you fall asleep. I'm like, I'm gone. Like, I'm gone, gone. And so I just, what do you do? You just, you just wake up. And so I just, I just woke up right there. And she goes, Pastor Paul, she goes, you, you fell asleep. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. No, I didn't. I was, I was praying. I, I was praying. I was praying for y'all's marriage. I was praying the Lord would just put the pieces together and work on the marriage. And, and she goes, no, you fell asleep. You, you so funny. You so funny, Pastor Paul. You know what's so great about her? She didn't send me an email she didn't get mad. She didn't get offended. I mean, she, oh, you're so funny, Paul. You fell asleep on the middle of my marriage counseling. Listen, this is, this is Eutychus in the middle of this, this session, in the middle of this sermon. He just, he just falls asleep. His eyes are getting heavy, you know, at my church uh, on Sunday morning. It's probably the same here, uh, is that people basically kind of sit in the same spot how many would raise their hand and say, when you come on Sunday night, you're kind of in the same section or pretty much, just go ahead and raise your hand all over the room. And so, yeah, y'all are all pretty much in the same spot. Like this is kind of like a human condition or something. We just kind of go all to the same. And uh, it's the same thing in my church. Like our different services that we have in the morning, it's like everybody just kind of comes in, finds kind of their seat or their, or their section. And, and I used to get a little bit bothered uh, way back in the day when I would be teaching or preaching on a Sunday morning and all of a sudden I would see some mouths that were just wide open. I mean, I didn't want to disturb them. I mean, I don't know if they had maybe worked all day or they had, had maybe they're on some medication or they didn't sleep good the night before or they have narcolepsy or I'm just glad that I can help them with whatever or, or maybe I'm just, they're just sleeping. I mean, they're sleeping during the sermon and I don't know, maybe I'm just boring, a boring, maybe that's why they're sleeping or whatever else. I'm glad I can contribute to their rest in the church. And it used to offend me back in the day. I used to get a little bothered by it, but uh, not, not anymore. Because you know what, in our world, our chaotic world that we're living in, if you can come into the house of God and just find rest and the peace of God in the presence of God with the people of God, that's what makes all the difference in the world. Can I hear a good amen to that? You can come in here and you can rest. Some of y'all are actually sleeping right now, and so maybe I'm, I'm helping. I'm helping the situation. But you can find rest. You can find peace in the house of, of God. But, you know, falling asleep, like in that counseling session, falling asleep in the wrong places can be a little bit dangerous. I don't think it was maybe Eutychus's plan to, I don't know what he did that morning. He woke up. Maybe he's a young man. Maybe he went to school or had a job and, Maybe he had some coffee during the day, and I don't think it was his plan to show up at church this particular evening and sit in the wrong place out in the window feeling that breeze, and it's a little bit warm and stuffy. Everybody's crammed and jammed into that room, and he's kind of looking this way and straddling the window seal. He's kind of listening to Paul, who's probably, there's nobody better than Paul preaching the gospel, and yet he's a little bit distracted. He's sitting in the wrong spot. I don't think it was his plan to kind of fall out 20, 30 feet and hit the concrete and die and somebody to raise him from the dead. I don't think that that was probably in his plan to sit in the wrong spot on an edge or on a ledge. But when I I think about our, I don't think that was his intention, but when I think about our world and our relationships and things that are happening with our family and the pressure that's going on in our chaotic world, our crazy, even this, this year, what's happening, navigating work and family and future and dreams and all these kind of things. 
Listen, it's very easy for the enemy of our soul just to slip in, and he can just do it in a moment, right? And he can pick off some things or cause some things to slip in our lives, and we can fall asleep if we're not careful on the wrong things. We fall asleep in places, on people where we should be awake. First Peter chapter five and verse eight says, we do have an enemy, he's lurking, and he's not looking to lick you to death, He's a lion, and he's looking to what? Be alert of a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for somebody to devour. I mean, Eutychus found himself. Sometimes we can find ourselves, just to be honest, maybe drifting, maybe it's our devices, maybe it's a detour, maybe it's just something, the poles of life. This wants my attention, this wants my attention over here, this is vying for my worship over here and over, over there, or just too many things sometimes. I found myself down through the years, sometimes even in ministry, like just too many things in my hands, just too many plates that are spinning and, and all of a sudden I can find myself just kinda drifting or maybe my prayer life slipping. Eutychus just kind of slipped out the window and he didn't plan to do that. He wanted to be in church. He wanted to be in gathered worship, but all of a sudden it just slips away. You slip away from God's word. You slip away from God's people. We just fall asleep if we're not careful. We sleep on our marriage. We sleep on our kids. We sleep on the things of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, it says, you are, ray of hope, Sunday night, you're the children of the light, the children of the day. We, as a church, we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So, verse 6, he goes on to say, he goes on to say, <laughs> he says, be, be, be awake, be, be vigilant. You know what's interesting about Eutychus is that Eutychus fell asleep and the lamps were burning. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like the lights were on. How many can go to sleep? I can't. Maybe you can. Maybe that helps you. I cannot go to sleep if the TV's on, if the window and the sun's coming through a little nap in the afternoon or whatever else. I mean, I've got to have that thing dark. Here's this guy, Eutychus, and the lamps are burning in the room and the lights are on. You know, talking about people who have their mouths wide open on a, on a Sunday morning, you know, I don't think that the Lord is really as bothered about sleeping eyelids as he is sleepy hearts. Or how about like bodies that occupy chairs but our hearts are far from him in the middle of the day when the lights are on. How I many we're supposed to be awake when the lights are on and he's sleeping when the lamps are burning. Not only we're supposed to be the lights of the church, but we're supposed to be the lights in the world. Let our lives not just shine, but notice a little skinny adverb, so shine. Let your lights so shine brightly out there. What kind of light are you? A 30 watt bulb? 60 watt bulb? A 100 watt bulb? What kind of a black light or a firework show or a laser show? Like what kind of light is coming off of your life? The lamps are burning and his eyes are closed and his heart is far away. Just letting some things slip in our lives. Paul the Apostle says it should not be that way. Romans chapter 13 verse 11 and 12. These are the things that we're supposed to be awake and be aware of. And do this, understanding 2024, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you, church, to wake up from your slumber because why? The days are evil. The days are evil. And so wake up from your slumber. There's always an anxiety. There's always uh, sometimes a temptation or an edge or a ledge or maybe there's fears and worries or trauma or hurt or the hurry in life or burnout or weights that we carry in life. If we're not careful, we can just fall. We can slip, fall, trip, and hit hard. And it hurts us and it hurts other people. There's a pain that it causes us when we just slip away from the things of God. It can cause pain in other folks as well. We just get tired on God. This should not be the case, right? Sometimes it's neglecting our own soul. 
Sometimes it's taking care of, even in the ministry, taking care of somebody else's kitchen table, and I'm not taking care of my own kitchen table. I'm not taking care of my own living room. Helping and serving other people's needs, which is wonderful, making an impact that way, but neglecting my own soul. This is what the Apostle Paul talks about. We can get unhealthy in some of these areas, fixing other people's problems, and we get tired and sleepy on God. Listen, if it can happen to Eutychus, it can happen to me, it can happen to all of us, but I'm grateful, here's the good news, I'm grateful for God's word that brings dead things back to life. Amen, somebody? For the church family and friends of mine to come alongside of me and encourage me and speak truth into my life when things were slipping a little bit out of control. They came alongside of me with grace and mercy and faithfulness and my friends brought resurrection power. That's what the church family is all about. This is what I've found out down through the years. When you live out, like Eutychus, when you live out of your worst day, God Almighty is okay. Isn't that good news? In your worst moments of life, God's grace meets you. God's faithfulness meets you right there. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, if you're taking down some notes. Even when we're faithless like Eutychus, we're slipping away. Notice it's met by God's grace. He remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. His mercy meets us there. God shows up in those moments. The apostle Paul showed up, went down 30 feet from the third story all the way down. And here's what Paul the apostle did not do. He did not gather everybody else and say, listen, this is what happens. He had it coming for him. If anybody like sleeps on my preaching, I know I'm preaching a long time, Paul says, but he didn't say, this is a great visual object lesson. Look at this dead guy, and this is what happens. You die when you sleep in church. How many know he could have done that? He could have totally gone judgy on it. He could have gone suspicious on it. He could have said, look right here, bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? He was deserving of this because he was sleepy in church and sitting in the wrong location, looking out the wrong window in the wrong direction. Look, he deserved death coming. But Paul didn't see it that way. He saw it differently. In fact, everybody else said he's dead. And maybe that's what sometimes we say over our own lives as it relates to counseling or when it comes to your pain or your trauma or your drama or your addiction. I just am not going to be able to RIP. I'm always going to struggle with fill in the blank. Or our marriage is just not going to work. She's never going to change. RIP. He's never going to get over what I'm wanting him to get over. RIP dreams. RIP marriage. RIP future. RIP with my purpose because nothing's going to change. And all of those gathered around said, this is a dead situation. And Paul the apostle says, nah, I see it differently than the way that you're calling this out. I'm seeing it with a different perspective. This is not an object lesson saying, look, this is what was coming for him because he was a carnal Christian. Where there's a pain and you feel as if it's not working or you've tried something or your kids are away from church and you feel like it's an RIP situation, God can make something happen. His spirit can move in and do something or shift something in a direction. The God of breakthrough, God Almighty says, it's okay, I'm working something out. It does not look good, but all things work together for the good for those who love Christ Jesus. Can I hear a good amen? that come on Sunday night God's spirit can make something happen he can bring dead things back to life two big observations for you not 70 I'm not going to go 70 points tonight two big ideas as it relates to how God takes dormant situations things that you call RIP things that look deceased barely hanging on by a thread that we can believe for something to happen when everybody else was saying it was dead Paul had something else in mind even when we say that hit hard even when we say the crash was intense Paul does something different he comes down which means to me number one we all need help in different seasons of life we all need help that's why it's a good church to be planted in we have connections there's prayer partners there's elders and deacons who stand with you that are for you and pastors and staff members that are there because why we need help 
James chapter five talks about with an open mouth, we should, in fact, all the solutions about how you can get out of the struggle bus or the stuckness that you're in right now is tied to or linked to an open mouth. You gotta open up your mouth and call on God. Are you finding yourself in trouble? Let him or her open up your mouth. Mouth wide open, I gotta pray, right? Is anybody happy? Let him or her sing some songs of praise. Verse 14, is anyone among you ray of hope? Suffering? You got some kind of need in your life? Call for the elders of the church and they will pray the prayer of faith, laying hands on you, anointing you with oil and will see that sickness save him and raise him up from that place that he was lying down, right? And so that's our God. It's all tied to how I can open up my mouth and say, I need somebody in trouble. I need some help. I'm struggling with my life. I need some things. Don't get alone with your thoughts, especially when you get hit. Listen, we all need help. You know, the Apostle Paul, it's a type of Christ coming down, right? Right? Paul came down three stories to help with this crash scene, this ambulance situation, right? And Jesus Christ is a type of the Apostle Paul in this story that he came down from heaven and he rescues us up out of the miry clay, out of our struggle. And what does he do? He lifts us up and out. God can bring life out of dead situations. Amen, church? Here's the second thing is that Paul spoke Life. Here's what our life needs to be. And I was just thinking about an acronym here. It was L-I-F-E. He spoke life. L stands for long-suffering. Long-suffering. In other words, everybody needs time. When you're going through a hard time, when you're going through a troubled situation, the twists and turns of life, everybody needs time. Listen, if you got into a bind overnight, you're probably not gonna get out of the bind overnight. (laughs) Barring a miracle, it's gonna take a little bit of time. What are we called to do as brothers and sisters in Christ when others of us are struggling? We're supposed to be patient with them. We're supposed to show mercy with those who are wavering, those who are wrestling, even with the claims of the Bible or the claims of Jesus. They're just, some of those things kind of come easier for some of us than other people, especially if we've been in church. It's kind of like, oh, I got that one. I got that one. I got that one. Check, 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 check. But other people, they wrestle with things. They're toppling towards cynicism or skepticism in their faith. Their faith is shaky or wavering or unsteady. What are we supposed to do? Not lecture them out of their doubt. We're supposed to come alongside of them with gospel friendship and show Jude verse one, chapter 1 says we're supposed to show mercy to them, snatching them from the fire, even saving them from death. Show mercy. Mercy, salvation, mercy. It's kind of like a mercy po' boy. Mercy spread on this side, salvation and a whole lot of church community on the inside where the meat is, and mercy spread on this side, and you put all that stuff together, and that's how we share our lives and care well as a church when people are struggling or in trouble. We all need help, but we need to speak life over those things. Everybody else in that church building was saying, this is a day situation but the apostle Paul had a different outlook he says I hear a heartbeat well it looks like it's all dead and gone Eutychus look what he did and he says ah God's got something no 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 God Almighty says no I hear a heartbeat right here so being long suffering with people patient in tribulation right that's what God does for us he shows us his mercy and his faithfulness even when we are Faithless. Here's the second thing, intimacy. Paul goes down and gets close to him. He doesn't like give him the silent treatment and storm off. He actually gets close in proximity to him. You know, sometimes when there's a disruption in the force, 
a disruption in our lives, a disruption or a breakdown in our marriage or a breakdown with our kids or how we're relating to people that we, that we love and sometimes we kind of want to separate or we want to kind of go far away or a ways away, right? And Paul doesn't do that. Paul gets as close as he can. In fact, he embraces Eutychus. He gets down into his world, right? He loves him. He prays for him in that, in that moment. He reaches out to him. Here's the, the F. L-I-F is for forgiveness. It works in a marriage. It works in a church. It works in uh, our relationships. How about the words, I forgive you? How about the words, I was wrong? How about the words, I was sorry? I made a really royal mess out of this situation. Forgiveness. You know, there's nobody on planet Earth that I have said I love you to more than Brooke. We've been married for 22 years. Pastor Kemp Holden married us. She's from Oklahoma. I was a youth pastor in Fort Smith, Arkansas for about four years and that's where we met and, and he did our wedding 22 years ago. And over 22 years, wow, I've said I love you to her thousands, I'm not kidding, thousands of times and to my kids, our three kids as well. Thousands of times. You know what else I've said? A lot of times, I've said I love you a lot, but I've said a lot. Will you forgive me, Brooke? Will you forgive me? And this is what I've come to, to find out is that the more that you love someone, in fact, if you love somebody deeply, you probably have to forgive them deeply as well. I'm sorry for my tone. I'm sorry the way I said that. That was a little bit harsh. It was a little bit brash. I could have said that better. Will you... I'm, I'm sorry, bro. Can you, can you help me? You know what? God really blessed me with a, a beautiful gift, Brooke. She's inside and out. And every time I have humbled myself to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, I really don't want to do that again. I love you with all of my heart. Every time it was met with mercy. Thank God for it. It was met with grace. Hey, let's move forward. And she hugs me. And she kisses me and she goes, I'm just gonna go ahead and forget that because I'm not gonna keep a record of wrongs. Let's just keep on moving forward. Listen, forgiveness works in a relationship. It works in a church. Brothers and sisters, a little disruption or whatever. Hey, why don't you say, I was wrong. Even spirit-filled Christians, hey, I was wrong. I'm sorry, I blew it. Hey, I forgive you, it's okay. We love one another, right? Here's the, the E is expectant. L-I-F-E, expectant. Lord, I believe that this situation can turn around. I know my kid or my grandkid is not serving you right now, but Lord, I believe that you can turn this situation around. What did Paul say? I hear a heartbeat. I see something moving. No, nothing's moving. He says, no, I see some eyes twitching. I see his finger move. His toe just moved right there. Eutychus, this is not a dead, ruined situation. And when it comes to our lives and our addictions and our drama and things that we think that are not going to change, Paul the Apostle and God Almighty says, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not done working yet. I'm faithful God. Same yesterday, today, and forever. I hear a heartbeat. It's not dead. This dream is not deceased. I hear, I see some movement. I still see some life. If he did it for Eutychus and he does it for Paul Mason, he'll do it for you. You know, one of my favorite shows, maybe you've seen this show or you can go check out this show if you're interested in doing that, but it ran for about nine seasons. And uh, it was called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. How many are familiar with that, with that show? I think it stopped airing about 2012-ish, 2013, and... Uh, and so it was hosted by a man by the name of Ty Pennington. And so he was on the show. He was the face of the show. Uh, awesome. Ty Pennington. I mean, he was charismatic. He, uh, he had frosted tips. He had highlights in his hair. He had choker necklaces. Uh, he had Hawaiian shirts and sandals and decorative jeans. Very powerful. And so Ty, Ty Pennington, every single show, and what they do is they roll up on a wrecked house 
in need of an extreme makeover. There's a family that's there. Let's just say a, a husband and a wife and their three kids. And there's insulation and there's floors that are and the ceiling is collapsing. And I mean, the lawn hasn't been taken care of in like five or six years or whatever. There's no running water. There's no AC at all. And they just kind of roll up. And then Ty Pennington grabs a megaphone and he gets the whole community involved. He said, we're going to do something to extreme make over this wreck of a situation, this house that has been, I don't even know how anybody has ever even lived in this house, and we're going to do something in five days. And so what they do is they give some plane tickets to this family of five, and hey, why don't you guys, it's on us. I'm going to go ahead and just get you guys on a plane, and we'll send you all to Disney, and then we'll have you all return five days from now, and you're going to see something different. And they go off, and they're happy, and uh, Ty Pennington gets the whole community involved. They start getting generous. He gets some contractors. He gets some repairmen. He gets some construction guys, insula plumbing guys. He gets all these things, and they go to work. I mean, it's like a picture of the church. I mean, they're caring for this family. They're making a difference. And this family is just off at Disney somewhere, some vacation. They don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, for five days, I mean, the grass looks good. They put a pool. They didn't have a pool before. There's a pool in the backyard and, and all these kind of things. And all of a sudden, this family comes back, and the whole community is down the street who have helped on this extreme makeover home edition project. And and, but there's something that the family can't see because why? If you've seen the show, there's a big, huge bus that's in front of the house. And so they get the family off the plane, and they're sharing with this family about what's going to be on the other side of the bus. And then he grabs Ty Pennington with frosted tips and sandals, and he grabs this, and he says something to the family. He says, you're going to see something different here. And he says, everybody say it together. Move that bus. Move that bus. Everybody, move that bus. And everybody, like thousands of people that are on this street looking at this house, this bus begins to start moving out of the way. And here's this family, and the kids are there, and they see this made-over, extreme made-over home that they had not seen ever before, and the kids are like screaming and yelling with excitement, and they're pushing water out of their face, and they're dancing and jumping up and down and then the man the husband is like I just can't believe this I just can't I, I, I just can't believe this is a completely different house this is new it's it's old but now it's new it's a brand new fresh start and then the wife that's there she's got to be spirit filled she's got to be a Christian because she's like hallelujah glory that's two syllables that's not glory one syllable that's glory Red, glory, glory. And she's going like this, and the dad and the kids, and they're dancing, and all of them go into the house, and they're like, the floors aren't falling apart. The ceiling, the insulation is back, and there's AC. There's a coffee machine that's right here. There's a pool, are you, cr for crying out loud, there's a pool in the backyard, and LeBron James is inside the kitchen, like making an omelet or whatever else, and they're going, this is completely brand new. You know, that's a picture of the church. A picture of the church that comes together and God is the God who does stuff like extreme makeovers in our lives of things that look like it's hit hard and it's a train wreck. God takes dead things and brings them back to life. Only God Almighty can do that. The resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead dwells inside of you. We got a brand new home, a brand new beginning, a brand new fresh start. It's the community of the church of God, a community of faith with love, care, forgiveness, mercy, grace, God's faithfulness, generosity, all of us. Can we just be that church? Can that be you? Can we all play a part in restoring other people's marriages and relationships? And God, start with me First, can I hear a good amen to that? Can you bow your heads and close your eyes here today? Don't fall asleep, but close your eyes just for a moment. Jesus, you're the one who's in the business of taking train wrecks, taking crash site situations. Lord, where we feel crushed or we feel like we can't change or get over anxieties, worries, fears, addictions, temptations in our life, 
maybe something with our relationships or something with our, our marriage. Thank God that you're the God of second chances. Thank God that you're the God of third and fourth and 57th chances. There's something unfortunate that happened to Mr. Fortunate. Eutychus means fortunate, good fortune. And man, there's an unfortunate situation, but God, you come into our unfortunate situation, sometimes because of our own choices and decisions. But God, you're the God that even when we're faithless, you are faithful and you are almighty God and you are strong. Lord, put marriages back together. Put relationships back together. Help us to be the church of the living God that comes together, Lord, to do an extreme makeover. When we move the bus of defeat out of our life, when we move the bus of fear and hurt and panic and worry, when we move that bus out of the way, the Spirit of God comes rushing in to our lives and change begins to happen and transformation begins to happen and healing begins to happen and your miraculous power shows up in and through our lives. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said a good amen to that. God bless you, church. It's been an honor being with you.